Hello, and welcome everyone to our virtual field trip. I'm Teresa, one of the board members at Washington's National Park Fund, and I will be your host today. Before we start, uh, there are a few housekeeping items to cover. This trip is 45 minutes with a presentation from our speakers and a Q&A at the end. Feel free to enter any questions you have in the Q&A box as we go. It is closed captioning enabled, which you can access at the bottom. We welcome any feedback as we work to make these trips as accessible as possible. For those new Washington National Park Fund, also known as WNPF, we are the official nonprofit partner for Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. We have the honor to work closely with these parks and their park leadership as we fund 30 to 40 priority projects each year. And just this past year, we awarded $1.5 million to projects that fall into four core areas, advancing science and research, improving visitor experience, expanding volunteerism and stewardship, and embracing inclusion. Today, we're excited to highlight a project our donors helped fund last summer, Terminus, a glacier memorial project, immortalizes the melting glaciers of the Olympics through art. We'll be taking a virtual gallery tour of many of the art pieces created for this project. In fact, we've already gotten a taste of the art with the beautiful song that start playing in the background at the beginning of the webinar. The song is called Patience by Taylor Johnson and it's about the Constance Glacier. Our speaker today describes it as what happens when a geologist writes a love song. You can listen to the full song on the park's Terminus website. Let's dive into the Terminus, shall we? Uh, joining us today is Eliza Good. Uh, Eliza Good has been at Olympic National Parks since 2016 and works on video, photography, social media, and web content. She created and led the Terminus Project with the help of the whole Olympic team made possible with support from Washington's National Park Fund. Eliza has a Master's of Fine Arts in Science and Natural History Filmmaking. It's an honor to have her with us today. With that, we're so excited to dive in to learn more about this important project. So Eliza, if you would, take it away. Thank you so much, Teresa. Thank you for that introduction and thank you everyone for joining me today. I'm going to share my screen and hope that it works. One moment, please. Okay, thank you. Hello, <laughs> I'm Eliza and I've worked at Olympic National Park for almost eight years. Thank you so much for being with me today. Uh, as you've probably noticed, I do something a little controversial when I present. I will read a lot of the words on my slides to you pretty much verbatim. And one reason I do this is so that if anyone with us today doesn't hear well, they can read the slides and not miss anything, kind of like subtitles. It also keeps me on track because I get very excited when I talk about this project. Um, without further ado, let's go on a little field trip into Terminus, the Glacier Memorial Project. If my slides will advance. Moment, please. Oh, here we go. There we are. <laughs> um, of course, this trip would begin in the Olympic Mountains, where for decades, scientists have hiked and skied to study the many glaciers that adorn those peaks. This long-term monitoring has documented the decline and projected the eventual loss of these glaciers. Some of them are already gone. The seasonal meltwaters of the Olympic glaciers are actually the headwaters of many of the rivers on the Olympic Peninsula. If you've been here, you've probably seen a river fed by Olympic glaciers. The cold water that flows from them is in a really important piece of downstream ecosystems. But as a change in climate accelerates the melting of glacial ice past what winter snows can replace, uh, as it has done for centuries, this life force is running out 
and by 2070, the glaciers of the Olympic Mountains will likely be gone altogether. I was thinking about this in a work retreat one day, and during just kind of a free form brainstorming session, I asked a question, what if we assigned an artist to every glacier in the park? And that was the idea that was, would be the seed of the Terminus project, which evolved into a digital artist residency and came to fruition in 2023. Uh, the way that that started was with a social media post. Um, I posted this photo, beautiful black and white aerial shot of this massive glacier with fancy script across the bottom saying, call for artists. Uh, and I posted it on our park social media. And I was impressed with the response. Uh, we had over um, or around 170 ta very talented applicants. And uh, the, the task of narrowing it down to about 40 for our most storied, photographed, and famous uh, prominent glaciers was not easy. <laughs> um, these artists work in all kinds of media. Uh, the Terminus artists include painters, poets, musicians, a dancer, a wood carver, sculptors, a quilter, a weaver, and even an artist who works in moss as a medium. Each of these artists was assigned their glacier. They were given photos and information about that glacier, and many of them also worked directly with physical scientist Bill Bacchus who has visited and researched these glaciers for over 20 years uh, to get a sense of their glaciers setting, its character, its story, its importance to the ecosystem and its place in park history. As they completed their art pieces, they went to live online in a Terminus web gallery that I built on a park website. Uh, and if you go to the web gallery and click on any of these tiles, you'll see not only the art, but a statement from the artist, an artist bio, and information about that glacier, including wherever possible, repeat photos of it. We did also get to bring all of the art together, uh, nearly every single piece, last summer at the Port Angeles Fine Arts Center for a gallery exhibition. Uh, and you can see that I mentioned the artist who worked in Moss. That's her piece there at the bottom center. So what I'd like to do now is take you on a bit of a tour of some of the art pieces. I wish we had time to do every single one, but for brevity, I've, I've tried to choose about a dozen that I hope give you a good overview of what this project became. Uh, because I think the most important part is the art and it speaks better than I could for, for what Terminus means. We'll start with uh, Heather Murphy worked on Deception Glacier and she created a naturalist journal. This is an excerpt. There are many more pages, but I thought that this was a really good representation because Heather was not only documenting the ecosystem, she traveled from viewing the glacier up in the mountains all the way through its watershed and to where it enters the Strait of, its meltwaters enter the Strait of Juan de Fuca, um, observing all along, not only the plants and animals and other facets of the ecosystem along the way, but also the emotions that this process brought up for her. And I think she shows that really incredibly in these matched paintings of Deception Glacier uh, one more realistic and one more abstract using geometric shapes and bright colors to express just how difficult it is to grasp the concept of the glacier's threatened future. These paired stained glass pieces by Mia Wyatt represent Jeffers Glacier as it was in 1962 and then in 2015 much diminished. And I'd like to share some of what Mia Wyatt wrote about her piece. She said, when I saw the open call for the Terminus residency, I knew right away I desperately wanted to be involved. They called this project an artistic eulogy, a river you could skate away on, 
a love poem to a changing planet. My ode is to the Jeffers Glacier, which is shrinking away in the Queets Valley. I hope I've captured how drastically the ice field has diminished. All of the glass was mouth blown in Seattle at Fremont Antique Glass, the intention being to pay homage to the creativity and beauty of this state. And I think you'll notice as we go forward that Mia was far from the only artist who not only in the execution of her art, but in the very materials she used, really wanted to ground her piece in place and connect it to this land. You'll see that pretty clearly in this next one. Kaylin Messer carved a serving platter and utensils out of wood that had grown in her glacier's watershed and then was salvaged when the tree fell across the road and needed to be removed. Um, and Kaylin writes, in life, we can find meaning and deeper understanding through conversation, nourishment of the body and soul, and spending quality time together. For me, this happens most often when I have the opportunity to sit down to dinner with folks for deeper conversation around a topic we care deeply about. I hope this piece will spark a conversation at your next meal and create a space where different perspectives can be held, discussed, and used to both grieve about the disappearing glaciers as well as celebrate the possibilities of our shared future. This is another artist whose materials are very connected to this land. Um, I actually collected these leaves here on the Olympic Peninsula, big leaf maple leaves for Natalie, who lives in the Midwest, and pressed them and mailed them off to her so that she could use a material that was nourished by the waters from her glacier. Um, and Natalie wrote, environmental changes can be deep excuse me, environmental changes can develop insidiously over the years, unnoticed between generations that each interpret their own experience as the norm. In 1995, fisheries scientist Daniel Polly coined the term shifting baseline syndrome to explain this collective forgetfulness, which allows for a gradual accommodation of the creeping disappearance. Like the size and quality of these maple leaves, the sprawling Humes Glacier of 1962, which you can see Natalie used the biggest and most intact leaf to depict, creates quite a different picture than in 2010, deteriorating even farther in 2015. Those are the middle and top leaves. If a pressed leaf serves as a tangible memory lifted from a specific place and time, let's keep them close to remember how much has changed and consider what could be preserved for generations to come. And I thought you might like to see a little bit closer detail of her painting there on the leaf. Next one I'd like to share with you is a paint, another painting from Brian Hackworth, um, who his statement, I feel, uh, along with Natalie's, really reflect what I was trying to do with Terminus. <laughs> Brian wrote, the beauty of the Terminus project is to eternalize many of the quickly dying glaciers of the Olympic range. And this view of mystery glacier is fleeting on a geologic scale. In a number of years, this glacier, along with many others, will not exist anymore. The mountains, rocks, moraines, sky and sun will remain for millennia after the glaciers melt away into the ocean. I was drawn to the thesis of this project, capturing these remote scenes as artistic impressions, because I believe they are important for future generations. Beyond the, object, beyond the objective images captured by photographs, art has the ability to portray the emotional importance of landscapes that we attempt to protect with national park status. But even this designation cannot protect our wilderness from climate change. I thought the two of them did a really beautiful job of encapsulating what I was trying to do with Terminus because as a park ranger, as Olympic National Park, we have a mandate to protect these ecosystems. 
and to preserve them, as both of them mentioned, whether intentionally or not, for future generations. And there are forces we can't stop at the park boundary, one of them being climate. There are, there are things we can't protect the park from. And so Terminus is kind of taking that idea of preserving and protecting something and interpreting it in a new way. And maybe the only way that we can preserve these glaciers is in art now. But that also has the advantage of preserving an emotional truth about what they mean to us. I think if you've seen anything about Terminus, you've maybe seen this next piece by Kate Evanson, who over hundreds of hours created this stunning embroidery of Jerry Frecky Glacier. Kate wrote, whether by natural processes or human influence, the planet is constantly changing on large and small scales. Through my work, I seek to capture fleeting moments of the world around me. I wanna challenge the idea that the landscapes perceived as timeless are also unmoving. It is my hope that by viewing my artwork, others may reflect on the natural places they love and how they choose to honor them. And Kate has a beautiful, uh, I'll, I'll share a detail so you can see the, the individual stitches in this, quite large, by the way, embroidery. Here's another piece with a very intentional choice of material. Uh, Nathaniel Anderson used charcoal to draw Hal Foss Glacier on Birchwood. Um, and Nathaniel writes, these glaciers are the last bits of an ancient memory. They will leave us until the next age, perhaps, but now we have them and can celebrate their beauty and natural force. Another artist who saw the importance of capturing this moment and holding on to it in some way. And I'll share a little more detail as well. You can really see the texture of that birch wood. This next piece is Eel Glacier, and it's woven in uh, tapestry by Kim Myris. What you're looking at are mirror images. You can see that, that mirrored ridge line uh, 50 years apart. And Kim writes, melting reflections, Eel Glacier over half a century is a pair of woven panels inspired by the changes in the glacial ice informed by photographs taken in 1964 and 2015. This piece, handwoven in cotton and wool, illustrates the rocks and tarn unveiled as Eel Glacier retreated and melted over 51 years. Um, Kim is not an artist who lives in this area. We did have uh, quite a few Washington artists, but we also had quite a few from all over the country and the world. Kim lives in another part of the country. And so as she said, she created this based on photographs, but just Put a little pin in that in your mind and, and remember Kim and her, her weaving of Eel Glacier because we're gonna see her again a little later. And I'll share a, a bit more detail. You can see the, the threads. This piece was actually created in collaboration. Suze Wolf had the lead on uh, this, on the Brotherton snowfield. And she brought in her collaborators, Arissa Brown and Janet Stone. And something I notice uh, when reading her statement is that Suze, like many of our artists, has a really sophisticated understanding of science and scientists. And I, I'm, all of the people who are part of this project amazed me with, with their incredible talents, but also just the breadth of their knowledge. And Suze is certainly an example of that. She wrote, many field science, sciences, such as glaciology, geology, and forestry use coring as a data method. But of course, those scientific cores only show the past. Our handcrafted, our handcrafted fabric imaginary cores add possible futures to glacial ice, 
earth and sediments, and trees. And Sue's wolf knitted and felted the simulated tree course. Arissa Brown dyed and quilted the sediment course, and Janet Stone wove the ice course. And so that you can see what this looked like installed in the gallery, I've got another photo here of these sort of hanging in space. So from one kind of unique medium to another, um, we had one comic book, actually. Maddie Bacon uh, created Mount Steel, a glacier story. And Maddie wrote, I spent weeks reading scientific articles and talked to Bill Bacchus, beloved glacier scientist, and Bill actually appears in Maddie's comic book, on the phone for three hours <laughs> to really understand the science of glacier monitoring. I picked my glacier after most of the other glaciers had already been taken. The Mount Steel Glacier probably wouldn't have been my first pick, but it caused me to explore ideas and narratives that I hadn't been thinking of and ultimately led me to ask the most interesting questions. And I think that's so true. And I know that we have some, I believe some of the artists have joined us today in the audience. And I'm happy knowing you're out there. And I know probably some of you also didn't get your first pick of Glacier. Um, we had quite a few different glaciers, but there are certain glaciers in Olympic that are just iconic, that everyone was like, oh, I'd like to do the blue or, but the smaller, you know, less famous, less prominent glaciers are still important to their ecosystems and no less worthy of a monument in my opinion. So thank you all for, for finding something to love and, and represent about them all. All right, here's, this artist actually created a triptych in watercolor. Claire Giordano does a lot of plein air painting out in the elements. She's got her kit that she can carry up into mountains. It, it's, she's, she's quite impressive. And she actually teaches this kind of painting herself. And when I went to try to find like the essence of her statement, something brief that I could share with you, I realized I didn't want to, I think, the whole thing is worth hearing, so if you'll indulge me. This is what Claire wrote about her triptych, Patterns of Loss and Hope, the Lillian Glacier. In 1905, the Lillian Glacier was a mass of ice that draped across the landscape in a swath of glittering white and striated gray lines. 110 years later, in 2015, it was gone, and the glacier's recession left behind a barren landscape of bedrock and gravel. The land still bears the impressions and memory of the ice. I chose the Lillian Glacier because even when I reflect on the loss of this glacier and witness the recession of others throughout the West, I still find hope in these places. I'm inspired by the scientists I walk beside who know the lines of the ice like the back of their hands. I am in awe of the small plants and vibrant green mosses that follow the ice up, up, up the mountainsides creating climate refuges for other creatures. I find wonder in the first moments of the day when an empty rocky basin glows with hues of pink and gold and deep purple blue. In this pursuit of hope, it, it is this pursuit of hope that led me to paint the Lillian Glacier in the triptych you see. The first painting shows the glacier at the largest visually documented extent in 1905. The second illustrates how by 2015, the glacier was completely gone, and I filled the void with excerpts from my field journals. And the third painting is an imagined landscape of 2125, when the gravel beds that once supported the glacier are filled with meadows, and the trees grow in the sheltered areas between ridges much farther up the mountain than they are now. Each painting is a snapshot of the glacier 110 years apart a glacier lost in all too human time and connected to a possible future of resilience and hope. This is the last piece I'm gonna share with you today in our virtual gallery. This is the Duckabush Glacier as painted by Dennis Pollard and it's one with special meaning to me. Dennis actually lives here in Port Angeles and he's been visiting the Olympic mountains since he was a little boy. 
but due to health issues, he's not able to hike and see the places he used to visit. Um, his piece, painted from a photo he took when he could ar get around more easily, has special meaning to Terminus because for many people, visiting these glaciers to witness them in person before they vanish is just not possible. But through art and a decent internet connection, we are still able to connect with them and with each other. So we did have that gallery show. I hope some of you are maybe able to visit it or that you'll visit our online gallery. Uh, but we also had a special event. Um, last summer, we had what we called Camp Terminus. It was a, a short summer residency for a week in August, 13 of the Terminus artists joined us here in the park. In the middle, that's Claire Giordano who did the, the watercolor triptych. And the artists gave presentations throughout the park about their inspiration and process, um, including a lot of demonstrations. And uh, our artist, Benedict Cosendila, a poet from Belgium, she actually noticed that her audience, that she was leading through a poetry workshop, were not all fluent in English, but she has several other languages and was able to give the presentation in three languages to keep everyone included. Um, and in this picture here on the right, you remember Kim Myris, who's uh, woven uh, mirror images of Eel Glacier we saw earlier. We took the artists on a hike up Hurricane Hill here in the park and that's Bill Bacchus, and he's pointing out Kim's glacier to her. She created her art from photos and had never seen it in real life until this moment you see here, um, which is, it was really special for me to see that. Um, I would be so remiss if I didn't mention that the residency week and Terminus as a whole would have been completely impossible without financial and logistical support from our nonprofit partners. Uh, Discover Your Northwest, North Olympic Library System, the Port Angeles Fine Arts Center, and of course, Washington's National Park Fund. Uh, and that's us at the residency week up on our, our very windy hike on Hurricane Hill, <laughs> aptly named. Uh, at the end of the residency week, we had a closing reception, and I'm afraid that our, well, I know what it says. <laughs> at our closing reception, uh, Lummi poet and writer Rena Priest gave keynote remarks, gracefully reminding us that as we address the climate crisis, Indigenous people have endured the action that brought us to this moment. Together, we must endure what it takes to find our way back. For descendants of colonizers, building a vision for a just future requires an act of imagination. For tribes, the vision for justice is an act of remembrance. So what's next? In the future, um, I say here we hope, but we are hosting a scaled down. We won't be doing 40 artists in a year again, anytime soon, um, but we will have a natural resource focused ongoing artist in residence program annually to honor many pieces of our ecosystem and the work being done by scientists to monitor them. And I am also working to create a toolkit for other parks and agencies that have expressed interest in hosting their own terminus and I plan to present at the National Association for Interpretation's annual conference in 2024. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eliza, for sharing that. Um, in a few moments, I um, got a little something in my eye. <laughs> um, that, is, that is powerful stuff in a way that that transcends uh spoken language and um i so appreciate you sharing it with, with all of us today and i appreciate from the bottom of my heart all of the artists with us today and uh with us uh virtually who um who poured their heart and soul 
into this project. Um, it's incredible, absolutely incredible. Uh, now is the, uh, the time to uh, open it up to questions and answers from our audience. If you have a burning question, uh, please feel free to share it with us in the Q&A box that you should see at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And uh, we'll go ahead and keep an eye on those and get started with a, a few for Eliza to uh, to kick things off. Um, if, uh, if anyone here with us today would like to see any of the glaciers that were featured in these art pieces, I know you mentioned one that is visible from Hurricane Hill. Are there any others uh, that are easily visible from Hurricane Ridge or other um, more accessible points within Olympic National Park that you can share with us so we can uh, lay our eyes and, and hearts on them ourselves? Yes, uh, from Hurricane Ridge, the most obvious glacier that you can see looking out at the Bailey Range is Cary Glacier, um, but there are several others. I wish Bill Bacchus was with us today. He could tell you <laughs> exactly which ones. Oh, that is a great start. And, and thank you. <laughs> those two, those sound wonderful. All right. Um, and oh, um, oh, we've, got, uh, we've got questions pouring in. Forgive me as I speed read these. Uh, we've got one uh, talking about the uh, the future of the art pieces that we, we saw today and were on exhibit uh, last summer. Uh, what will happen to the to the art pieces the physical pieces into the future are they going to be kept in collection or will be uh, sent into the world what what happens to these beautiful works that's a great question uh, it was important for me that while we as at the park had a digital representation that we could share online um the artists actually were allowed and and asked to uh, keep the pieces for themselves or use them as they saw fit. Mm -hmm. And there's no one I would put more trust in to know the right thing to do with them. And it's pretty exciting to me, the, the ongoing lives that some of these pieces have had, whether they're in other exhibits or other collections now. Um, I know at least one artist has been inspired to give presentations of her own, including her Terminus process and her pieces created for Terminus. So some of them, one of them, one of them is on my boyfriend's wall because <laughs> it was, it was very special to us and, and didn't want to be without it. Um, and, but they, they've gone on to have their own lives and, and out into the world. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, as it should be. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a qu another question about the artist selection process. Uh, you mentioned that there were many, many wonderful people that raised yeah. their hands to be a part of this effort. Uh, can you talk about the selection process and how you chose the cohort that, uh, that were able to share their gifts with, with us in this round? Absolutely. Yeah. The artists, for their applications, they shared if they had a sample of their previous work, of course, and they shared what drew them to this project in particular. And if they had any kind of um, the beginnings of a vision for what they would do. And I was um, I was amazed by how many people had a personal connection of some kind or other to terminus or the idea or to this landscape so many that we had people with with wonderful local connections that we weren't able to include simply because there were so many and it was very important to me to try and make the art and artists um, diverse because different things are going to speak to different people different media might impact people different ways. So it was it was special to me to have, yes, paintings, but also songs and also compositions and also felted wool sculpture and on and on so many different ways that were meaningful to that person. And so they become meaningful to the audience. But it was really hard. There, 
there are many talented people who I wish could have been um, part of this, but we simply didn't have capacity. Thank you. That makes sense. And that's a wonderful problem to, to <laughs> grapple <is>. with. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we've got a, a big question, which may be difficult to address in the time that we have. But uh, you touched on um, the glacier research and the science yeah. that, that went into the origin story of this incredible project. Can you talk a little bit more about what the glacier research for these glaciers or the Olympic National Park glaciers in general looks like now and um, into the future? Absolutely, yeah. So um, Bill Bacchus, our physical scientist, whose name keeps coming up in this, he was a really big partner of mine in, in making Terminus happen at all. Um, he and other scientists are conducting long-term monitoring. So it's still happening, it will continue to happen. And these scientists go out into the field every year to measure the glaciers, record their observations, um, work which is actually also funded by Washington's National Park Fund. So you all had a big part in actually every stage of this project before it even came to be. Um, but I can get a little more specific. The uh, National Park Service monitors glaciers every year in Olympic and also in uh, North Cascades and Rainier as part of the North Coast and Cascades Inventory and Monitoring Network. And the way that they do that is the teams of scientists, they visit the monitored glaciers in the spring to measure the snowpack that has accumulated over the winter. They drill a special 40 foot long stake down into the glacier and then they return in the fall um, after summer's melting has taken place and they use that stick to determine how much melt has occurred over the summer season and they take the stick out. And this way we know whether the glacier is gaining or losing mass each year. Most, if not all, are losing mass at this point. Mm. Um, and we continue to monitor the glaciers so that we know their status because that's really important to understand threats posed downstream. Uh, like threatened salmonid fish that depend on that really cold water from glacial runoff. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Big, big topic. All right, I've got two more uh, questions. Uh, the next one also may be wide sweeping. Uh, the, um, <laughs> uh, as you reflect on the project that is and the project that will continue, you uh, mentioned will be shared with the, uh, the Park Service and larger forums in the future. And congratulations, well-deserved uh, on that. Um, can you talk about the other positive or unexpected outcomes that you've seen come as a result of this effort? Yeah. Um, one thing that I didn't expect and that started before any of the art was even completed was the way that people drew together. The mm -hmm. artists themselves immediately wanted to like form a little community with each other. They were, they were passionate about the project. They all had such different um, experiences and backgrounds and media, but they wanted to talk about what they were doing with others who would understand. And I think that's been a theme throughout, just a sense of connection among people. Um, the feedback that I've heard has been overwhelmingly positive, and that means so much to me. I I had hopes of what I thought what this might mean to people, um, but I've been surprised by even my own emotional responses to it. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I'd be I'd be reading someone's artist statement, I'd be like, "This was my idea," and it's still just hitting me. <laughs> um, as I said, the art pieces themselves continue to have lives of their own, um, going on to be part of other exhibits and presentations because these artists are so passionate about what they made and why they made it. Um, but most of all, I think it's kind of an intangible outcome that I'm not, I don't have the power to measure, but I think the way that people who are touched by the project choose to go forward from here you know, my hope is that it reminded people of, you know, the things that we hold dear and the kinds of choices that we can make as individuals 
uh, and as a society to protect those things before we lose them because we are losing the glaciers, but there are things that can still be saved. And so I hope that people feel more connected and hopeful and inspired, whatever that might look like for them to make a positive difference. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And one more before we wrap up. Uh, we mentioned that there um, there is a a website uh, that is focused yes. on these works uh, where folks can can dig deeper into the works we saw today and see the other incredible pieces that we weren't able to uh, to showcase in our our limited time that are are absolutely uh, worthy of 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 love as well. Uh, can you tell us where folks can can find these pieces to spend more time with them? Yes, if you go to the Olympic National Park homepage, webpage, uh, just the front page and scroll down, you'll see a big, beautiful uh, painting of the Blue Glacier. And if you click on that, it'll take you to the full gallery with all 40 pieces. Wonderful, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, before we uh, start wrapping up and uh, hand the floor back to Casey, is there anything else that you'd uh, you'd like to share with us before we conclude our field trip with you? Uh, just gratitude. It um, it means so much that Washington's National Park Fund saw this as a priority. Um, Terminus was able to happen because people took a chance on an idea I had, and in in the case of here at the park, that was my my supervisor and coworkers being willing to put time and resources and their their energy into it and in the case of donors like you all it it meant that i was able to spend my time on this at work it meant that i was able to put in the hours it meant we were able to bring those artists for camp terminus it meant we were able to have the gallery show and so that i i can't thank you enough i am absolutely sure that the 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 feelings are 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 mutual and um and and deep for everyone here um thank you for sharing that um and thank you for for sharing this with all of us and um and thank you for everyone who joined us today uh for this field trip uh whether you're new to the Washington's National Park Fund family, uh, an existing donor that we all thank from the bottom of our hearts for supporting this project and other important projects in our three incredible Washington's National Parks or a artist that helped make this happen. Thank you. Um, thank you so much to, to each and every one of you for, uh, for being here and being with us to raise attention to this important and uh, and beautiful project. And um, if you'd like to see other episodes of our virtual field trips or join us for a future field trip, um, you can find the, the previous uh, virtual field trips at the Washington National Park Fund YouTube channel that you'll see up on your screen. Uh, we have so many many incredible talks that we've had the opportunity to enjoy with representatives from all three of our parks over the last several years. And uh, we invite you to uh, to spend some time with us and those field trips uh, and um, and those incredible individuals to, to learn more about what we have been up to in our big, beautiful backyards. And if you're interested in joining us for future field trips, uh, you can find those at the virtual field trip portion of the website, uh, as well as uh, in-person event opportunities. Uh, you'll see a screenshot of our upcoming virtual field trips and events up on the uh, the screen now. Uh, thank you so much, Casey, for, for sharing that. Um, well, this is a snapshot in time for the next few weeks. Um, if you'd like to uh, spend more time with us, We'll, uh, we'll keep it going and I encourage you to keep an eye on the website for more virtual and in-person events to come. I'm so excited about each and every one of those and hope that you are 
too. I look forward to seeing you there. Um, as always, uh, if you have any questions about the Washington's National Park Fund or our work, uh, you can find us at WNPF.org. Um, for now, though, all that's left to say is thank you so much again. Thank you, Eliza, for being with us today. Um, thank you to all of you, and we will see you at our next virtual field trip. All the best. Thank you. Day.